Okay, so about about six months ago, we had this idea that we needed this like like trick to start the show. You know, everyone's has this kind of gimmick, right? Mm-hmm. And we're thinking, you know, what would be really cool, right? And we came up with this idea. This is like a product of groupthink, right? Mm-hmm. We came up with this idea that I would serve a cannoli and an espresso to in the beginning of the episode to each guest. And we'd kind of like sit here and like eat this cannoli together. W- what does this have anything to do with the brand? Nothing. Okay. Nothing. Just pull a little blood from the head. Get yeah. It in the stomach. It's like this mafia <laughs> moment where you have a cannoli and a coffee <laughs> for some reason. And I haven't seen you in probably 10 years. Yeah. Easily. So how unusual would it be that the first time you see me in 10 years, I slide a cannoli in your direction at 930 in the morning and force you to eat it on camera. This kind of reminds me of that scene from uh, The Wolf of Wall Street where they put the donuts down. And like, if you, if you eat the donuts, if you don't eat the donuts, that's telling them that you're guilty. But if you eat them, that means you're comfortable. You got nothing to hide. And so one guy just polishes off the entire plate. Right. Um, it's a trick. Yeah. It's like, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a it's, trick. It's, it, you level with whoever you're eating that cannoli with. Cause you're like, yeah, this is, uh, this is going to be on, this is on camera. This is going to be a part of the public record. Me eating this cannoli with this, with this guy. I'm not a pretty thing. eater either. You know, there's some people like Jada, <laughs> Jada De Laurentiis, whenever her show was on, she would eat and there was something very almost like sensual about right. her eating. And then there's other chefs that get on there and just, you know, you make a lot of crumbs. Yeah. They mow down an entire slab of ribs and you're like, that's not attractive in any way. <laughs> uh, I'm in that camp squarely. You're a crumb. Camp. You're a crumb. You would have been a crumbs guy. I'm a crumbs guy. Yeah. yeah. And I don't My think they're going to let us old looks better eating than I do. I, I love it. I mean, I don't even think there were a lot to eat in here, but fair enough. You know, anyway, so the place that we met, the place, the, the last place that I, I, I go back to, I go back to another version of myself. Mm-hmm. I go back to the version of myself that was trying so hard to be something that ultimately I ended up kind of like be, be realizing I didn't really even want to be yeah. once I became it. So like, what, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the last time I saw you, we're in a share, we're in a share house in Nantucket. Yeah. I'm on garden leave for two weeks for my job. I remember that. You're working where at that time? Uh, I think I might have been heading to Oxif. Um, okay, like one foot out the door, but probably in the in the same headspace that you were in. Okay, so like we're like the young chosen ones, right? Yeah. The Wall the Wall Street legends in in the making. Our vision of what it's like to go out and make a bunch of money and mm-hmm. hang out in Nantucket and wear pink pants and drive a fucking Land Rover or whatever it is. Like we were there, we were doing it. Yeah, and in that moment. It felt like we were on the right path. Uh, absolutely. I think that that's part of, I find myself experiencing exactly that thought process with a little bit more frequency now than maybe I did in those moments um, for a variety of reasons. I think not the least of which is having had kids now recently and having still very young children, um, they are in my experience and have been kind of an incredible mirror of sort of potential and viewing this life that it's very much quite literally in its infancy. And then the variety of paths that may be Mm -hmm. open and available to them. And I can't help but at the very least like challenge the paths that I took. And you and I were talking about this last night that ultimately like our character, and this is just my opinion, but our character I think is just the net result of decisions we've made and actions we've taken accordingly. And in those moments, sitting on the back porch of a friend's house in Nantucket and talking about whatever it was that we were talking about, fancying ourselves amongst the, you know, the sort of the, the smartest guys in the room kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it felt correct. But I do think in retrospect now, a lot of that correctness was informed by what we had kind of been told was this right path. And it felt like we were checking a lot of those boxes. Like, oh, you went, you know, if you had the opportunities to get a college degree, you went and got one. And then if you had the opportunity to go get this kind of high-flying fine job, you went and got one. And then you 
sought to go up that ladder in the time you could and in the way that you could. And I think at least for me, and it sounds like for you too, those processes were very infrequently challenged as to whether or not they were not just correct in an absolute sense, but correct for you. Mm -hmm. And now I find myself asking me a lot of those questions of like, does this adhere to that character that I'm trying to be the most authentic like version of myself are the decisions that I'm making and the actions I'm taking in alignment with that. Mm -hmm. Um, Back then it certainly felt like that, but I think as people mature and as they begin to sort of question things in a positive way, oftentimes they arrive at answers that would have seemed at odds with the path that like you and I were on 15 or 20 years ago when we first met. But it's, I think it's important um, to do that And it's important to ask a lot of those questions or ask any questions or ask any questions at all. Because I think like to your point, exactly. We were just, I mean, we're sitting on this back porch and we're kind of like, yeah, we're in, we're we're doing it. We're in the game. What what other options are there? Yeah, this is, this This is is the only option. This is the option. And then you sort of take a step outside of it for whatever reason, either you actively want to take a step outside or you were sort of pushed aside. Exactly. Then all of a sudden, you see, oh, there's a completely different equation at play over here. There's a whole nother world out there, there's guys. There's a whole world, yeah. I do think that, like, increasingly what I've seen is a, a, a general greater willingness to, like, question, particularly, and this is just based on our own experience within finance, people saying, like, I wonder if there's a different way. This seemed mm-hmm. to be the correct path. Maybe it doesn't adhere to what it is I really want to do with myself and my life. Mm-hmm. So you can, like you can make those decisions as they come. But I think ultimately it goes back to on like a micro scale, second by second, minute by minute, there are opportunities to make decisions and take actions that either are in alignment with like the character that you're creating for yourself, your true self, or they shove it aside for this perceived better path. It may not actually be in alignment with what you want to accomplish. So what does this mean? Right. Because everyone, you know, I get a thousand DMS a week. How do I get into finance? How do I go to a good school and go to wall street like you, Nick? And I'm, and I'm, it's just, it's, it's hard for me to read that. Right. Because I said, you know what I say to myself when I read this, I can't respond to all these messages. I'd love to, I can't is I'm the last person on planet earth. You should be asking that question because look where I am now. Yeah. This has nothing to do with that. Yeah. What the connective tissue is that I understand f- markets and finance on a deeper level than the average bear. Right. And mm-hmm. I'm involved in that business tangentially with my insurance company, but it's like, uh, I'm the, don't ask me. I'm the guy that escaped with his life. Yeah. And his well, or dignity eventually. Yeah. yeah. There were moments where I didn't have much of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we could we could go there later, but it's by the way, you could have stayed and also not escaped with your dignity. Right? Well, I think so. staying was the most dangerous thing, not because Wall Street's evil and suck. It clearly that, like, yeah, I'm not that guy that's saying that. Right. Of course. I met some great people. I had a lot of fun. I made a lot of money. I, I got to act irresponsibly. I got yeah. to do all the things yeah. you'd imagine yeah. a young man would be able to do in that position. But it was just like, if I stay here, I'm going to go fucking crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm going to be, you know, holding up a 7-Eleven at some point at three in the morning. <laughs> you know what I mean? If, I, if I'm left to my own devices. Because there, God, there has to be something more to this. It, for me, there has to be something more yeah. to this place. There has to be something more than waking up at 4.30 in the morning and yeah. not remembering what happened. Yeah. There has to be something more than uh, having a string of relationships where you don't even know if they're good or bad because you're sleep deprived. Yeah. You're, you're not even sure who you're talking to at night. Yeah. There has to be something more. Absolutely. But I, I do think it's important to say that for some people, that path may be perfect and may be perfectly yes. attuned with yes. what it is that they want to accomplish. Yes. That is great. Um, I do think, however, that particularly within like the confines of finance, there is this aura that has been created that sometimes synthetically attracts people to it Mm -hmm. despite their best kind of underlying wishes. The Hollywood version. The Hollywood version. And I mean, they literally like make movies about it. You know, you look at Wall Street, which is so funny. Oliver Stone creates the movie Wall Street as 
sort of an um, homage to this is everything that's like bad with the world. He right. says it himself. And, and we're then, there lined up in the theater in pinstripe suits cheering it on yeah. like it's a fucking And then Giants he gets game. like a thousand, you know, DMs the following week about like, that was so great. I want nothing more than to like be Gordon Gecko. Right. And so there is this natural... Like, you know, sure it wasn't a DM because yeah, it's not a DM. Definitely not a DM he for got the fact checkers out there. He sent to his office. <laughs> probably a fact. Yeah, probably a fact. You're good. You're good. Um, but there is, you know, there's a piece of that. And I think a, a not small part of it is that finance, which is just the movement of money, makes the world go around regardless of industry. And so being at like the center of that is always going to be attractive. But I do think it's important, regardless of industry that you're in, to begin asking those questions of yourself because I, because again, there's this quote that I think is, is generally um, credited to Thoreau, I think. And it's that to live is the rarest thing of all. Uh, most men simply exist. Mm -hmm. And I like that quote has always stuck with me because I think for a long time, particularly 15 years ago, when you and I met, we were going through these motions that seemed to be the correct ones, but I think it was just a form of existing versus like actively. Yeah living in in the way that we felt was best for us and now that I've got kids I look at that and I sort of say like I ask myself the questions on a daily basis and then do as best I can to like provide that platform mm -hmm. for my own children to then be able to at some point like question things <laughs> and make sure that it's in alignment with what they want I'm just I'm, I'm like p p pretending I'm not uh like in this room right now and I'm listening and I'm and I'm just thinking like fucking assholes like of course it's so e the hell that what no one sees is is the traumatic experiences that ultimately the both of us had yeah. between the high fives on the beach and crushing 30 racks you know in the back <laughs> of a you know back seat of a jeep or whatever yeah. it, it was you know to like oh i'm gonna do something and build my own thing yeah there was like uh, w w what i didn't even know about your stories is horrific uh and wildly incredible experience yeah. in between yeah. that. So it's, I'm this. glad you brought that up. Cause I think for me, that was a, like a massive well, uh, cornerstone. Let's talk about, yeah, I mean, if I'm you don't happy mind. to get into it, basically being in finance in the way that I was in nearly killed me because I think at that point I was flying, I was trying to think about this last night, actually, I think it was like 250 or 275,000 miles a year in the air. And is I'm, that executive, what, what, what does that put you in? Triple diamond, Delta, secret probation? Delta 360, which is I, above. I've never even heard of that. It's above diamond. <laughs> um, they used to send me and my wife birthday presents. Dude, They'd baller. send us anniversary Why did gifts. you quit? Why did you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I think the I'd distance stick to the moon, by the way, <laughs> is 270,000 miles. So I was basically like flying to the moon. Holy shit. Um, well, but give, I was, give us like just a couple bullet points yeah. of your career. because So at that point... Um, I had moved on from Oxif. I was at another, you know, great hedge fund called Marshall Waste. And I had been doing a lot to try to build out business units in Latin America. So being, you're going down, looking at, looking at businesses and deciding who to invest in, who not, what they need, what they don't need. Yeah, more so helping to define like new product development. If there's like strategic right. partnerships we can create, distributing those products across Latin America. Being from Latin America originally, that seemed like a natural just sort of, you know, skill set, speaking the language for the most part. You know, I didn't speak Portuguese, but for the rest of, you know, Spanish speaking Latin America, I was able to do it in, in, in sort of my colleagues native tongue, which does make a difference. So anyway, 250,000 miles a year later, I, it's funny. I remember for about two weeks before this incident happened, I had been having back pains and I, well, what I thought was back pains. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was like sciatica, sitting at a desk, like looking at sitting Excel, a desk, sitting in an airline seat, yeah. trains, planes, and automobiles and boardrooms. That's yeah. basically what it was. Yeah. And um, thought to myself, all right, I got to do this one last business trip to Dallas, Texas. And then when I got home, go to the chiropractor and he's mm -hmm. going to set me up straight. Yep. And I get down there and I remember with a client walking from his office to a restaurant and on the way there, my left leg felt like it weighed a thousand pounds. And all of a sudden I started dripping sweat. We get to the restaurant, I go to the bathroom and I was like, man, how is it possible that my back is making my entire body feel sort of depleted? So long story short, um, I'm at my hotel. I'm supposed to go back to New York. Uh, my flight gets canceled. 
I have to go the next day. I have to switch hotels. I'm going to this new hotel. I get into my hotel room and I'll never forget it. I open the door and I guess the like angle of turning into the door tweaked my body in such a way that I felt this massive shooting pain like out of a gun down my sort of entire left side, lower extremities. And it was excruciatingly painful. I was, I actually fell to the ground, was sort of like clutching my side, clutching my leg. I called my wife. I explained what had just happened. She said, that's weird. I have no idea what's going on. And I thought to myself for a split second, I'm going to take a bunch of Advil and just take a nap and, you know, sleep this off. And then tomorrow morning, I'll get on my flight, go home and go back to the chiropractor. And then the pain just would not subside. So I looked at my leg because it felt like most of the pain was in my leg. And so I sort of undid my pants and pulled them down. My left leg was purple oh boy. and two times the size of my right leg. And so basically my wife, to her credit, said, I don't think you should take that Advil. Maybe you should call someone. Yeah. Call the ambulance. They come. Long story short, I get to the hospital and they tell me I've suffered a, a massive blood clot in my abdomen, which is basically cut off all the blood flow that should be coming out of my leg. So the blood was going in, it just couldn't get out. So it was like a water balloon just mm -hmm. filling. What that does is puts an incredible amount of pressure on where the blood clot is. And that's usually where things go wrong is you shoot, they call it shooting the blood clot and it ends up as a pulmonary embolism or as you know, in your heart and you drop dead. Now I got taken to Baylor Heart and Vascular Hospital, which ended up being incredible blessing because the hotel that I was at the night before was closer to Dallas General mm. and things probably would have ended up differently had I ended up there. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I'm in the ER and in the ER, all they care about is loss of life. And so they kind of do their thing. They take a look at me and basically they come in and they said, yeah, you've got this massive blood clot. So we're going to need to amputate your leg because that is the quickest way to preserve your life. And there, it's not like a, it's not a, they're like, there's a pretty high chance. If we don't do this, you're going to die. That basically that's the option. It's like cut off, you know, s lose the leg to save the life. That was what it was. They marked my leg up with permanent marker. They shaved it down. I sign a release. They brought in a priest to like, not necessarily give me my last rites, but to like help me through the fact that I was about to walk out of, not really walk out of that room, but right. with one less leg. Right. Uh, I remember calling a buddy crying and I was like, dude, they're going to, cut my fucking leg off. This is the worst Tuesday of my life or whatever day it was. And I called my wife and I told her that too. And to her credit, she goes, she basically was like the fuck they are and hung up the phone. Mm. And I was like, oh, what's going on here? I'm in Texas. Texas is the size of a country and I'm in Dallas. And she is sitting in New York thinking to herself, all right, my husband who I've been married to for three months now, this was in February of 2017. Uh, is about to lose his leg above the knee and which is very different than below the knee as I understand it. Who do I know in Texas? Mm -hmm. Just kind of being like, who do I know in Canada? It's so big. Right. So she calls someone in Houston, which is not very close. That person knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who ends up being the head of thoracic surgery at Baylor Heart and Vascular. And so he's the guy yeah. that if you're going to have a shot at, at getting out of at this getting thing. out of this thing with both legs, with both legs. He's maybe the dude he can to help out because out. The, the OR or the ER doctors, they're like, this is the plan. It's an amputation is going to take us 30 minutes and we can go to the next room where there's mm -hmm. someone else suffering from some other awful thing and move on. Right. It's not like you're upstairs. We're like, we have nine hours to take care of this. They, that's not what they care about because it's loss of life. Most importantly. So quickest, easiest way to keep you alive. That's the plan of attack generally. And I'm over simplifying, but that's basically the, mm -hmm. the decision that was made. Lizzie well, calls a person in Houston who calls a person who calls a person ends up being this guy who's the head of thoracic surgery. He comes down. They're like getting ready to roll me out. They're like, who are you? And he's like, I, sorry, I know this guy. This is a friend of mine. I was like, I've never fucking seen this guy in my life. And he comes, he's like having a tough day, huh? And was, I'm like crying. I was like, yeah, they're going to cut my leg off. He goes, hold on a second. looks at my file, steps out. I can see him. He gets on his phone, says something to someone on the other end, comes back in, basically says like, Hey, I'm going to send you to someone else. I think they can take care of this differently. So within, I was within minutes of getting wheeled into a room and having them, you know, saw this thing off. And then I'm upstairs for the first of what ended up being like six surgeries with the head of vascular surgery mm. at Baylor Heart and Vascular to mm -hmm. do what's called a bilateral fasciotomy, where they basically from knee to ankle on both sides of your leg, cut down to the bone to relieve that pressure because your body starts to like necrotize when there's that. If you much, see me getting white, it's because, uh, you know. Yeah. 
I can show you the pictures off, no thanks. off camera. No it thanks. looks like the Tsukiji fish market in no, no, Tokyo. No, no, no. It's pretty gnarly. I'm, I'm out. I'm out for that. So part. didn't die, didn't lose the leg, but because of this very, you know, invasive yeah, process, invasive process, but also like very unique sequence of events that like all the stars had to perfectly mm -hmm. align, mm -hmm. not the least of which was if that flight hadn't been canceled, I probably would have shot that clot on the aircraft. And at that yeah. point they throw a blanket over your head and, and that's like, that we're going to land with this body. Right. Um, the reason the flight was canceled be was because of winter storm Nicholas rock and roll rock and roll. Um, and so I'm like sitting in the intensive care unit for a couple of weeks, starting to analyze my own existence after having nearly lost it. So and you're telling like, me that perhaps you would have never asked these questions. I may if not you weren't have. sitting in a hospital bed forced basically to not work forced, forced to not move and forced to then be like, all right, I almost died. Everyone said like, you definitely should have lost the leg, probably should have died because of how this all went. And I sort of said, great. Now I've got a new lease on life. So what does what that do to the dream? Do what does that do to yeah. the hedge fund dream? I think in that moment, it just caused me to question whether or not that was a dream that I really wanted, or was I in the business of making other people's dreams come true? And I think that the conclusion I came to was I was in the business of making other people's dreams come true. And I needed to find a way to make that my own or change it all together. And so at that point I started to basically move down sort of an adjacent path within finance that would give me a little bit more autonomy, but also make me feel like I was contributing to and participating in the value creation in a more meaningful way, not just meaningful to like the, our investors and to my colleagues, but also to me. Coincidentally, then like recovered from this whole leg thing, was in a wheelchair for a while, then had to do crutches, then a cane and all that. Finally recovered. And then the following spring got cancer. So I was like, oh, this is what it feels like to get kicked in the dick multiple times mm -hmm. and just have to keep getting up. And again, it was just another thing of like, okay, Someone is telling me, like, we're going to give you another shot here. Maybe just question whether or not the shot you took is the one you want to keep taking. That's kind of, it's an oversimplification. Mm -hmm. And it sounds very Hollywood to say, like, yeah, I almost died. And so that made me think, hey, I can live again. What am I going to do with my life? But that's the cards I got dealt. And so I played them the way I thought I could or should. And it led me down this path that is still within finance, but on the venture capital end of things, working much more closely with people who are arguably really going after their, their dream. dreams. And I can do so, I can help them in a much more closely knit mm -hmm. capacity. It almost makes me feel like I'm then like participating in that dream creation mm -hmm. versus being at Oxif and being like, so we own Microsoft. Um, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? That's, that's pretty cool. You're huh? like, just get I've out. Never met Bill Gates. Uh, probably never will. Right. But this is the reason why we love this stock. You're like you ever heard in, of computers? Yeah, <laughs> ever heard of computers? A <laughs> lot of lot of fun stuff happening You're on like, the web. Get out yeah, exactly. of my office. Walking into someone and being like, "Peace." Are you familiar shit. with surfing the net? Uh, that's kind of want to own the company yeah, that brought that to the greater public. Exactly. <laughs> All like, you've got to do get the fuck yeah, exactly. out of my get office. Of here. But now I can go talk to someone who's building something that I can then like sit in their office. And I'm not going to say it's the same thing, but I think it's analogous to if 35 years ago, like Andy Bechtel's time sitting in an office with the Google guys and being like, oh, now I can, I can like actually like touch yeah, There's more this contact thing. There's to the contact to yeah. it. Yeah. Which is a hu the human side of this, as opposed to just the numbers from a distance. Exactly. I fly in, I see what things I can move around, exactly. you know, have a bigger distribution channel for the widget that yeah. I'm looking at today. Exactly. And then I get back on my fucking flight and... <laughs> You know, I go back home and have a couple of Bloody Marys sitting in first class. Have a couple Bloody Marys sitting in first class. Could be worse. Yeah. Wait for the anniversary gift from Delta and right. keep, keep flying. Right. How is it even possible that we have to go through death, <laughs> yeah. near death experiences just to go, do I even want to do this? Well, I also think <laughs> for a lot of people, you don't have to go through that and they still find themselves getting there. And so I think there is in general. You this, don't have to go you, through no. it, but you, but you have to confront office, at this. 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning yeah. after having worked a 36-hour kind of shift on the Excel spreadsheets. You're like, this is no... I remember seeing a guy... <laughs> I, I didn't know him. I sort of knew someone who knew someone, and he sent out this email saying, like, this is no life. That was his sort of resignation. Email. This is no life sitting here Damn. doing this. Um, That's heavy, bro. It's heavy. <laughs> but I think people are now sort of questioning that because 
there are other there's other things you could do avenues yeah to success and i i i actually do strongly believe that and this is where kind of the venture capital thing comes back into play that with the advent of just like pure technological advances happening on a micro scale it has provided a platform through which people can find other ways to do things mm-hmm. um and and kind of carve out their own life like 20 years ago what you do on a daily basis was not available to anyone right and all of a sudden it is the ways in which that you can have that you can have an idea and scale it and reach so many people so quickly you know it used to be if you wanted to build a company you needed like a box of nails and a hammer and that was what you did you were henry ford and you created the model t now you can start a company on your fucking iPhone Mm -hmm. and you can use platforms and technologies that other people built to substantiate what it is that you're trying to accomplish from the comfort of your couch. Fast, no capital investment. Exactly. That naturally creates a whole new set of opportunities that I think people have recognized. And as a result of that, begin asking themselves the question like, all right, is this path that I've been on or been told to be on whatever their unique case may be the correct one? If not, maybe I should start looking at this whole other menu that seemingly is more open than it ever has mm-hmm. been. Or or start ordering off the menu. Walking in the restaurant and going. Build your own. I order off the menu yeah, because I'm that kind of guy. You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Because there is no menu. There yeah. are no gro- The grooves are grooves of Wall Street. By the way, we're so fucking, we're, we, we're guys, we're, tech wasn't even a thing really yet. No. <laughs> like tech was for People over there on the West Coast, absolutely. Like, we don't know about that. We're over here in New York. Like you got to be kidding me. Tech. It was well before what is it, Silicon Alley? They call it now in New York. Yeah. Like that 2006, 2007. At least to me, it certainly didn't exist. No. And by the way, I should sort of like underscore all of this by saying it's a nice position to be in, to be in finance and have the the luxury, frankly, of being able to question whether or not this. I think comparatively like cushy pathway. Yes, it's hard work and yes, there's long hours and yes, there's shit you're going to dislike, but it's still a pretty great place to be. So I fully appreciate that having just had the opportunity to question whether or not that pathway that a lot of other people would like die for same reason why you get a thousand DMS a day saying, how do I get into finance? Sure. To be able to say like, how do I get out of finance? That's a pretty great place to be. Sure. But it's to me, the, that type of environment is a way of, of forward settling your whole life. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not horrible, no. but it's, but it's not great. Exactly. And so you say, Oh, I'll put my whole life on hold until T plus two. And yeah. it just keeps moving yeah. indefinitely yeah. into the future. Yeah. And you go, huh, I'm still here. Yeah. You sort of like mortgage today for yeah. tomorrow's happiness, but that forever mortgage is a thousand yeah. year term in, perpe- in a perpetual yes, exactly. c- contract terms. Yeah. And, and a part, so what I think sort of like happens there is you, it's like this delayed gratification that at least in my opinion, seemed like increasingly it would never actually come, right? There's always like, you get to the top of a mountain and then the next one's just higher. But let's play a game, right? It's like, you know, I had my experience looking, coming in and seeing the, the MD on the trading floor there before I got there and he lives in Jersey and he looks like he's going to die. And, <laughs> and I was just like, holy shit. You know, there's, there's some young, uh, there's some sort of analyst next to me. I go, would you fucking look at this guy? He's here with us. This is the worst job in the world. And yeah. he was just like, why? He's like, why would you talk about that to, like, he's what you want to be. He's the MD. Mm -hmm. What do you add to your mind? I was like, I don't want to be that guy. Look at him. He's here before us. His whole day is spent hanging out with a bunch of 25-year-old punks who think they're smarter than this and and no one's worth their shit. And he was just like, well, why are you here then? Yeah. And I was like, but in that I don't example, have a good answer for that. Specifically, though, son. I think the example I had was I would, like, from 9 to 5, right, look around and be like, this fucking sucks. And then... You get the first class seat to Brazil and you're you having dinner. Slide your feet into some sweet Gucci deal sleds. Exactly. <laughs> you're at having dinner at the Fazano with an endless travel and expense account. And you're kind of like, I like this. This is great. But isn't that so, it's like sick. You're like, it, it is, it's the closest thing to making a deal with the devil that I can imagine. You're <laughs> yeah. like, the devil's like, you're going to hate it. Yeah. But I'm going to give you luxury yeah. and delicious champagne. I'll give you just enough snacks and medium along rare the way to keep you safe. Steak yeah. and beautiful high thread count sheets and robes and status. Yeah. But 
to get it. In the in-between moments. Everything you don't want to do. Yeah. All day, every day. Yeah. Seven days a week. Yeah. And you can't tell anyone that you don't like it. That's part of the deal because <laughs> yeah. I'm the devil and these are complex deals, right? So you're going to hate print. it. The fine print. The fine print. Read the fine print when you're making a deal with the devil. Yeah. The fine print is you're going to hate it. You can't tell anyone you hate it. Okay. And the, and the spoils you're going to get so goddamn used to at some yeah. point, they're not even going to mean anything anymore. Yeah. And to ch- put the cherry on top, when you go to sleep and you fantasize about your your ideal life, your hero, the guy that's, you know, international man of mystery, you know, going in and saving the world, you're nothing like him. You're yeah. not solving real problems and challenges. Well, at least I wasn't. You're fucking around on a computer, mm-hmm. uh, moving n- imaginary numbers around, yeah. and your heart is palpitating, and you're getting older, and you're here, and you can't take a leak, and that's <laughs> and that's it. You're not James Markets Bond. Markets are open, man. Markets are open, sweheart. You're not that Gatorade bottle. You're, and yeah, keep ripping. yeah. You're not James Bond. <laughs> you're not the the country gent. You're not this ideal from a fucking Abercrombie and Fitch or, or Ralph Lauren ad. Like you're not the guy throwing the football. Yeah. With the kid, like you, you're, you're something else. Yeah. You're like a facsimile a hundred times. And it's just like this in dull outline of a person. Yeah. You're not like, you're not the thing that you thought you'd be. Yeah. And, yeah. and that disconnection that was, that became more and more real. And I was just like, wait, I'm not even rich. I'm not even going to get rich here in the way that I think exactly. of wealth. So on that point specifically, the conclusion that I sort of ended up coming to at the end of all the health stuff was if I stayed the current path, I cannot guarantee that I will ever kind of hit those wealth levels that I had fantasized about or whatever when you like. And let's just say the standards standards set pretty goddamn high. Yeah, because you're like, like, well, the guy that manages the hedge fund makes 400 million a year. So that's really what I'm targeting. Exactly. I was like, all right, well, maybe I won't be Dan Ock and he made $400 million last year. But if I stay this path, I felt pretty confident that I could guarantee that I wouldn't get there. That was kind of the, and maybe that was wrong, whatever it felt right in the moment to be like, I can't guarantee that I'm going to hit all those mile markers the way that I thought I did when I was 25, Mm -hmm. but now at 33 and at that point, maybe I was 34. I was like, I just don't think I don't see it happening that way. And right now, yes, I'm being given enough like breadcrumbs along the way to make it feel like I'm still living my life. Yeah. But I wasn't really. And so then I thought, okay, if I'm actually going to be happy in my own right and feel like I'm actually carving a path versus just like staying in the pre-carved one in the lane. Yeah, exactly. In the, in, it, the, you ever go on those horrible, like there's bumper cars that are in like tracks. Yes. Like what could be more dehumanizing? <laughs> like the whole thing about a bumper car is you get to decide, but it's in a track. Yeah. Oh, dude. When I was a kid and I was like, I fucking hate this ride. Yeah. It's in a track. This I is go ridiculous. Off <laughs> I want to like smash into Tommy on my own volition, you yeah. know, in my own unique curvature. Yeah. Well, Sorry. that's ultimately what, I think huge started huge like bumper car guy, the as you VC. <laughs> I mean, it's a good thing to be. Uh, I think that's ultimately what started this sort of VC ethos, which was like, I mean, for a long time, it was, what was the phrase? Like uh, move fast and break shit. That's the bumper car analogy. Exactly. Like there is a path. Every sort of good business has kind of, in my opinion, been predicated on the idea of like building a better mouse trap. Maybe it's a completely new one, but like, I think, when people have always said to me, like, that just sounds like a better mousetrap, my reaction is always like, that's kind of the, that's the, like, cornerstone of evolution. Right. Right. Or, like, at least, like, progress as a part of evolution. The person saying that just sounds like a better mousetrap is repeating what a guy said that he knew that he thought was really cool, <laughs> who said, that looks but like a better mousetrap. Yeah. And the guy that's saying that is repeating for some other some other guy said about a better mouse. But if we never built a better mousetrap, then we'd all still probably be riding fucking horses to work because no one would have ever thought like, what if I put a wheel on this thing and that turns itself and then you got the Model T? Right. I mean, that's sure. That's probably like a Hollywood explanation of it. But I think that the core of it is still true. But the what sat at the heart of that was challenging if the first thing, the first mousetrap was as good as it's ever going to be. And that's exactly what you and I are talking about. So in my own personal experience, I just kind of felt like I needed to 
find a new path. Yes, I was still on kind of the same playing field, but I wanted to get a step closer to feeling like I was, I could like touch, see, and kind of feel the work that I was doing and really actually then also be able to take inventory of the progress over a period of time. Because I mean, the other thing in finance is like, I mean, right now it's like bonus season, particularly in banking. And you see, people, and everyone's getting smoked. Everyone's getting absolutely rocked. I'm like, man, I remember that. I would, have, galore. I would have what I felt was a banner year, working my balls off, all this. And then at the end of it, because of some unforeseen. Hey, Nick, come here. Come in yeah, the office real quick. The office. This is tough for me. Hey, I'm man. like, oh, if it's tough for you, I it's going to be really gonna tough be like for me. For me. <laughs> uh, it's going to be tough for you. Yeah. I'm the one who thought I was going like, to get fucking 200 just, grand. You just put in two new pools at your house. I feel like I'm going to be in a slightly different <laughs> camp. You actually have a hot tub that runs in salt water. Yeah, and exactly. It's tough for you to tell me this, yeah. you fucking asshole. My drain's been clogged for six months. Right, right. Um, yeah, and then, you know, on the other side, it's like, oh, well, we had this thing that happened and this Which thing happened. Which has nothing so. to do with you. Right. And so then how it's, it, it became like almost mathematically impossible to quantify the effort that Did, I was can doing. Can we explain what we're talking about here with, real quick yeah, in like general it. terms? Yeah. Okay. So basically when you work on Wall Street, okay, and this is really uh, a fact, whether you're a trader, you're an investment banker, you're you're in PE, you're in a hedge fund, whatever. At the end of the year, you're, you've earned a base salary. Okay. That base salary is a fraction of what you hope to make mm -hmm. or, or believe that you're going to make. Yeah. <laughs> well, you with some, you know, salesmanship and yeah. whoever from the guy that runs a business, it is a fraction of what you think you're going to make. Yeah. Your base salary means nothing in Wall yeah. Street, right? At the end of the year, they basically said, say, what did you do this year? Okay, good. I'm going to pay you a chunk of that. Yeah. Okay. This eat what you kill mentality. And this goes across everyone in the business, investment bankers. How did you perform? How many deals did you close? How many how, how many people text me and say you're a smart guy if you're young, young in your career and you yeah. don't have any revenue to, yeah. to show, right? So um, revenue is not the right word. But anyway, like the, the idea is your end of year conversation is the make or break conversation. And at least in my career, it was always... Hey man, you did a great job, <laughs> exactly. but you work in a big bank. Yeah. It's not just you, Nick. Yeah. And it's actually thousands of other people. And so the we're funny thing about you them, against all of them. And the funny thing about those thousands of other people, they're fucking idiots <laughs> compared to you. Okay. Yeah. So your performance, yeah, it doesn't really mean anything yeah. because the guy over here was a rogue trader and blew up the fucking bank. And so now you're screwed because of that. Yeah. And that was the first thing where I was like, wait a second, I don't have any license or authority over my own life. Like yeah. I'm like, wait, so I work hard and then nothing happens. Yeah. I don't work hard. Maybe nothing happens there too. Yeah. So, the, and then that's like post office mentality. The reason people go crazy in the post office, I think, and I've never, you know, I've had some horrible jobs, but <laughs> post office like, but not at the, is because it doesn't matter what you do. You yeah. could be, sm you could smile, you could frown, you could yeah. yell, you could throw the package on the ground. Yeah. You could throw the package in a fire, but it probably nothing happens to yeah. you, right? On a professional level. Like that's dehumanizing. I mean, how could you, how could you feel? awesome about things when you just you go i do good being told i did an incredible job and you're down 30 percent right and i'm you're like huh? hold the math is not mathing yeah really and that just felt so while you were talking I imagine doing that, this to an imagine doing this to an animal i mean yeah a dog comes in you know he you know he takes a crap in the toilet flushes it brushes his teeth and comes back and you're like you're a bad dog that dog would end up killing the whole family in the middle of the night, <laughs> yeah. you know? Or the dog does that and you're like, great job, but the cat shit over yeah. here, and so like, we're going to punish you I'm for that. I'm sick of paying the price for fucking <laughs> yeah, exactly. El Gato over here, okay? <laughs> I'm the dog. Yeah. What does the cat have to do with anything? I know. We're so different species. It's like it became very hard to feel like, all right, I'm actually getting compensated financially for the true value of whatever it is that you were expected to do. Or just your effort, your or general your effort, effort or yeah. buy into the whole process. Yeah. Because and this you is would disillusioning have, when the, you don't have this connect, connectivity. And I think the dis disillusionment also increased dramatically post-2008. So I think that that's a big part of all of this, where prior to that, certainly in like the 90s, if we want to say that, like everyone was eating pretty high on the hog for the most part. And then 2008 was either the last straw or the beginning of, or somewhere in between, of kind of like a massive compression in that whole dynamic. Like Meaning hedge, everyone's getting rich. Yeah. So like everyone was getting rich and then 2008 happens and it's like, okay, in the hedge fund world, like hedge funds don't make the kind of returns they used to make, but they still charge the same fees. Hold on. We're going to change that. So, but 
the same amount of kids were still graduating college and saying, I want to get into iBanking. I want to get in the hedge fund yeah. world. I want to do all that. So like, the supply was as high as ever. Yeah. So there were twice as many people wanting to eat from that pie, but the pie was just getting smaller, smaller and smaller, smaller. smaller. And I think because of that, it was probably way easier if you were a, you know, 30 year associate at whatever I bank in 1997 to be like, I'm willing to continue with the fuckery because like things are great. Things have been good to me. Yeah, this exactly. But then you have like, like I was, you know, this guy, uh, liquidity, uh, -huh. he like posts these comp reports during bonus season. And it's just a nightmare. It's a bloodbath right now. And I think that in 97, it was easier to be like, all right, well, I was getting paid a hundred grand and I got $300,000 bonus, whatever the number is. And you're like, all right, I'll stick with it another year. And then that sort of continued. Mm -hmm. But then you have guys who are like, man, I worked like 18 hour days for seemingly 365 days. I did great. Quality of my work was phenomenal. And 25 years ago, this bonus should have been six figures. And now I got 10 grand. The rules are different. The rules and, are and the rules change without us really realizing. But there's also something else operating here. The in this business, just being the box checker and playing the game and being a part of it meant that you might have actually made a lot of money without putting a lot of effort in. Mm -hmm. You just kind of rode the wave of that market. Yeah, just as I know is happening. Exactly. You know, still in tech where there's engineers that are doing nothing but playing video games because they're just being kept away from competitors and mm -hmm. warehoused in a talent cave somewhere in you know silicon valley yeah. where they're just like it's better that you're here and not doing anything than working for fucking pinterest you know <laughs> or whatever it is right so it's like that's there's these industries where you can participate in these curves but we were just so perfectly unlucky unlucky enough to be told everything was going to be okay yeah to have that built up idiotic 20 year old status thinking we're the kings of the world and then it completely not being delivered on. Yeah. And so that was like the story of the 2008 generation on wall street. I totally agree. And you know, you like you said, for my effort, maybe your effort, maybe you're not, but the, the rules of the game in that business, I was no longer willing to play those rules. Cause the rules were, if I make a million bucks, pay me 20% of that. If I make 20 million bucks, pay me 20% of that. If I make a hundred million bucks, pay me, that's the rules. Of the, if, if that's not the rules of the game, if you just make up what yeah. I get paid, well, yeah. it's all good. I just don't want to play this game anymore. So I'm gonna go somewhere else, yeah, Exactly. you know, and figure out what the fuck else that thing is. And whether you're working in a goddamn supermarket with, you know, the manager going, Hey, you know, you fucking bagged that shit wrong again. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not, I'm not thinking you're getting that promotion, whatever it is, you but know, at least in the supermarket, there was like, yeah, generally like an hourly rate that you could then go to and be like six going hours to, yeah. equals this amount. Right. <laughs> uh, and then well, you've but, yeah. got these kids straight out of college working 18 hour days and you realize like their hourly rate actually is lower because they're like grinding for so long that they're sleeping under their desk. Well, it's a trick. It's a trick. Right. And, but so because I think it was this, this sort of perfect storm of, Things happening in the economy with the GFC that created global financial like a, crisis. Yeah, sorry, global financial crisis that created like just a massive dislocation of kind of everything, regardless of what it is. But within finance, it then had ripple of effects far beyond finance. Plus, then I think, as I said earlier, this the advent of these massive technological advances that created this perfect storm of people being like, "This isn't what I thought like the movie was going to be." So I want to try something else. And then I see all these other opportunities over here that seemingly could create an equal or in some cases better outcome for me financially, but give me a lot more autonomy, a lot more, in fact, maybe like literal financial ownership over mm -hmm. the kind of hours I work and the return I'm getting on those hours. And so meaning I do something good, something yeah. happens. Yeah. Like it's a, something good could happen or something bad could like I start to. I start but to if the actually good happens. I can see what the result of that good will be versus yes. like I worked 365 days. I did great. Let me you talk to some random guy I in did. an office who I haven't talked to all year. Yeah. Who's going to tell me what he thinks, even though he doesn't know me right. really at all. Yeah. But He's he'll gonna, be like, you did an amazing job, but we're going to have to pay you down. Right. Yeah. And, and that is something that I don't think I recommend, uh, to most people for their own sanity. If you're in a, if you're playing a game in this way and it doesn't have to be wall street, 
Yeah, it could again, be anything. I think this could be real estate. You know, this is just our experience real of Wall Street, Let me tell you but it could be anything. Yes. It could be any industry yes. that you're in. It could be fucking marketing and advertising. Absolutely. And you're at the whim of the entire company's But It's like, well, why don't I open my own shop Yeah. and take the risk? Yeah. Okay, so the of course, when you, uh, when you leave this world, the downsides become really quite significant, right? Because at the end of the day, we're, we're sitting here complaining about 100 grand here and there, but we did have a base salary. Yeah, right? exactly. A so base it's, salary. it's a cushy position, as I said before, to be complaining f- or, you know, talking about or, in fact, complaining. But you, well, you were complaining. I was just talking. Yeah. But, but <laughs> it was only the, you that was a complainer. <laughs> <laughs> the experience, though, I think is like, if that's what your experience is, then just because someone else's was better or worse doesn't completely invalidate your no, experience. We're just opening up the, the, the dialogue that no one on planet Earth would be willing to do because if you pull up a finance podcast, God forbid you do that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Like, oh, God. Well, it's just not fair. I, I, po- yeah. Finance podcast. No, thank well, you. The, I mean, but you have these finance podcasts, which will be accidentally I mean, you, finance podcasts, accidentally finance podcasts, or you'll just like, you know, I remember seeing there was some, some guy whose name I'm forgetting now, but anyway, he was with another industry big wig. And that person said, Oh, this guy got down to like his last hundred million dollars. And he put that hundred million dollars into XYZ company. And the moderator was like, well, how'd that go? And he's like, well, I turned it into, I don't know, 2 billion a couple of years later. Right. And the way that that interaction was being pitched is like, oh man, he was really on his last string. Yeah. Last hundred million bucks did that. And then I opened up the comments and people were like, what world are we living in that this dude is talking about? I, I, I only had a hundred million down bucks to the wood. left. Yeah. I was down to the, the studs. Exactly. Down to the studs on this. And then I turned it into 3 billion. So I fully recognize that like a lot of what we're talking about, it will fall flat for people. And that's, Understandable. I, I hope I hope not because what we're what we're saying is question whatever it is that you're doing if there is dissatisfaction and if there is something that missing. Part, yeah. Or if there's not, Absolutely. it's all good, y'all. Like yeah. I'm all good. Like I, I I just you've you've had an experience where you were laid up, to say the lightest, laid up for quite some time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a little bit more of a layup than that, but you you were like laid down. you were laid the fuck down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, you you were forced to confront your life without the benefit of being like, oh, I'll just scroll through it. I'll just fuck. It's like you faced the demon, and you're like, I think I'm going to make an adjustment, mm-hmm. which for you was going into your own direction and yeah. building your own brand and going out and funding companies that you believe in, mm-hmm. and. So it's not this, you don't have to, compl- you know, you don't have to start making TikToks, guys, if you, yeah. when you leave Wall Street. Yeah. Um, but I think your point is, is exactly right. Like we're just speaking via our own experience. So that's kind of the only thing we have to go on. Right. The deeper question is the one that I think, like you said, if there is a, a piece of you that's just like feeling unfulfilled, and I wouldn't say that like you had one bad year and then you question your entire existence, fine. But if you kind of go through those motions repeatedly and the different outcome that you were expecting continues not to manifest probably the right time, at least in my experience to then question some things and see, and there may not be a better answer, but maybe there is. And that's, I think just like the work that is, it's valuable to do that and at least see what else is on the table. But for a long time, like certainly you and I had the experience that beginning that questioning process was looked at like, what? Why would you ever, you know? And I think increasingly a lot of people are having those conversations or at least like acting on them a little bit more frequently. That's just been my experience and what I've seen. And it's what I've started to do as well. Just, you know, like I don't live in New York anymore. I lived in New York for 16 years. You sort of leave. Holy shit. You don't live in New York and no. you're on this sh- show. I know. Get the fuck out of here. Bro. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Central, <laughs> central Virginia. Not exactly the the hub of like financial prowess. Silicon, uh, uh, yeah, Silicon, Silicon, Silicon barrel. Stocks. Yeah, uh, I don't know Silicon anything. Barrel. Yeah, um, I don't know anything. Silicon. Hay that bale. wasn't fair. That it's, wasn't fair. I will say this: like jokes aside, Charlottesville does have this pretty incredible little pocket of like. I was thinking cra- Cracker Barrel oh, plus yeah. Silicon. This is Silicon Barrel. <laughs> Silicon Barrel. All right, that's a working title. Yeah, um, that's actually your memoir. 
is a <laughs> yeah, silicone, silicone barrel. barrel. Um, a high a high flying tail of VC in this house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the high flying tail of VC in this house. I'll rent you back that I title because it's I can already see that been warehouse. flying off the shelves. Yeah. My um, team's already purchased all the rights for yeah, it. So we'll, you guys, we'll rent it back to you. All right, good. You've got the you've got the landing page. <laughs> yeah. Um but was in my own experience, like there was a time, you know, just like hanging around Manhattan and, and still being very actively like physically in the in my opinion, kind of the center of a lot of the financial universe, certainly within the US, that I felt the part, right? Yeah. And could not even begin to see how there was like life outside of that. Mm -hmm. And then I make this joke to you that my wife and I went to visit, you know, family in Charlottesville, planned to be there for three weeks. And that was four years ago. And now I sort of having the benefit of a different perspective. Now look at that. And in some ways I still sort of miss parts of it. Obviously it's a huge part of my life and New York city like is, and will always be a big part of my life in the, in the kind of the universe that came along with living there. But other parts of it, I'm like, man, I can't believe that I drank that Kool-Aid for that long because it's like I, a toxic relationship. Yeah, like I, I'm living my life four years into it, not being there. And it's not like my lot, my life stopped right. when I left. In, in fact, fact like, I think it deepened and enriched in many ways. I, I, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, and again, for some people, they might look at that and be like, I don't want to move to Charles, well, it sounds awful. Like how many people are there? There's 50,000 people. You, that's, that's not even like the Barclays center. Right. <laughs> and they'd be right. But I just, I think that the, the sort of the, what I'm underscoring this all by saying is there are other ways to like look at things. And I do to like the general population's credit, see people like questioning those different sets of perspectives. And at least again, only in my own experience, seeing people actually begin to acting on those in a way that makes for meaningful change in their own lives. And like you said, it's not like if you're like, I'm not going to be in finance anymore. Uh, yeah. I just, I want to be a dancer. Right. You don't have to like, it's not a, a game of extremes. I'm a perfect example of that. I'm still in this like ecosystem, just kind of adjacent to it, doing it in a way with some bells and whistles that fit my life better. Right. Uh, it's not saying it's better or worse for anyone else, but it all came about as a result of being like, maybe I should just sort of like, question a couple things here just to do the litmus test, see if there's some other options, other ways to, to kind of workshop this that work better for me, which 20 years ago, I was like, I wouldn't dare ask the questions, but now there's guys who are that age who are asking those questions. And I kind of think it's a good thing because either they're going to leave or they may come back with some different perspective that I actually think is probably accretive to what it, they want to continue doing mm -hmm. in, if they're an investment banker, they might challenge some things They come back with a different set of perspectives and it adds considerable value to their path that they want to stay on. But just sort of like stepping outside for a little bit to see what else is out there. Maybe there's different ways to think about things. It's always going to be a good exercise. I think the model is start somewhere, whether it's in an investment bank or at the grocery store or at the corner shop or where or in marketing or wherever the fuck right start somewhere yeah and if it feels good keep going and if it doesn't <laughs> go somewhere this podcast else podcast sounds like it's taking a, a little bit of a turn if it feels good it feels keep good. going come on yeah um, that's that's totally the agree. model right so it's not like i don't think it's i need to do this well go and try it yeah. check it out yeah. Take a spin. Take it for a spin. Just don't take it for a goddamn eight year spin like I did. Yeah. You know, and then at the end of those eight years, realize that you don't have any transferable skills. Yeah. You know, hey, uh, I've moved down to New Orleans. I'm going to play in a band. Let's see how good my uh, fucking options trading has to do with this. Like it's it's a complete it, my skill set was almost in the technical level that I had. It mm -hmm. was almost completely useless. I had to have access to billions of dollars of capital to express my strategy that mm -hmm. I, I worked my whole life on. Right. Mm -hmm. One thing at least about in tech that I see with certain people in tech is like, they kind of go, Oh shit. Like I could just leave and do everything myself. Yeah. So like that skill set, you know, it's a good point. Uh, that skill set. I always, um, I look, I lust, you know, and I'm a, I'm a, in my own way in that universe. Right. But it's like, I always just lusted after the bill. I'm like, damn, you do this here. And when you get bored, you just go, well, I got my own idea for something. I'm just going to go do it myself. 
Yeah, it's tough to be uh, to be sitting in an I bank and be like, I'm just gonna go start my own investment bank. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm just, yeah. just gonna do that. I'm gonna hang weekend. my shingle up. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, so what size? Slightly uh, tougher. You know, lift. what kind of market do you you work in? Well, I've got like thirty grand. Yeah, okay? exactly. So I got to spread this pretty thin. Yeah. All right, we're doing gonna, micro investments. I'm gonna co-finance a pastry shop down yes, the street. Exactly. If uh, that. If that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just the ovens. Right. <laughs> um, so, okay, yeah. so that was another strange thing that I wish I had the, the insight around. Like, hey, it's cool to be on the morphine drip and in the f- nice flights and all this shit. But it's like when this p- music stops, can I feed myself with this skill set? Like the famous example that I witnessed firsthand were the guys on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange in the, in the World Trade Center were trading crude oil and natural gas open outcry and these dudes were rolling around with sweet pieces driving out in fucking turbos out of the garage and I'm like I want to be that guy yeah I love the grit I love the determination I love that they didn't give a fuck where anyone went to school just like I go hard I this is I make tons of money and I'm like this is the best the second that shit went to screens when it became pr- predominantly computerized trading as opposed to predominantly open outcry trading, meaning people for facing people and yelling at mm-hmm. each other, those guys quite literally had nothing they could do with their previous skill set if they yeah. didn't learn the computers, right? Yeah. So about half, of, I don't know the, the, the ratio, but half of the guys said, I'm going to learn computers. And they survived and they stuck in that business. The other half said, I, I literally can't make money anymore. Here. Yeah. And then they you know, got blown out and they had to go do something else. And I think we like have to make sure that we're not those guys. Like we're not, we're not, we're not spending our whole life as a high end tool that does yeah. one thing Yeah, that we're like a screwdriver that yeah. only fits in the back of the iPhone screw. That's so small. And they have their own fucking screwdriver. What the fuck <laughs> What's up with that? You know, like I'm a specialized screwdriver and I make a lot of money because I open very expensive electronic products. But if this product should change or the market changes and shifts, yeah, I am a changes. useless piece of metal. Yeah. yeah. And I think we find ourselves, at least I did for many, many years of being like, Oh, sh-. I didn't realize it until it was far too late. I do um, think so. As you were talking, one thing that I was reminded of, I have to this day a very close friend. He's a partner at Goldman. Um, he's one of the most talented people I've ever met. He's like snaps. You just always you got to do some kind of ritualistic snap yeah. when partner at Goldman. Just, yeah, exactly. Okay. He's uh, anointed. Um, <laughs> I uh, yeah, like, and, and you know, outside of all that, just like a very brilliant human being, a very awesome person as well. And ages ago, I remember we were talking about sort of skill sets, again, within the context of finance, but basically the end of the conversation was how do you sort of avoid being the like screwdriver that fits one type of screw and then that screw style changes and and now you're sort of obsolete. Now you're screwed. Yeah, now you're screwed. Nice. Yes. Nice. Nice. And basically like the, what he was saying was coming back to sales really everyone should be in sales and whether or not you think you are, you are in sales in some capacity. If you're a buy side guy and you don't think I'm have anything to do with sales, you're internally probably selling yourself to someone else who may have some authority over your pathway and your trajectory. And right. you should probably do a pretty good job of honing those skills, those sales skills to sell yourself, or you're actively in sales and you're out there convincing someone to buy a product that you have and whatever. But basically what he said was, I was kind of like, yeah, I'd love to get in this point where I'm just kind of like managing, you know, I was like 25 or something. And I was like, I'd love to just manage people and just do that. It's like, so it's like you literally crushed a Coors Light can on your head yeah. this weekend. I know. What probably was are you was managing? Like, yeah, maybe you should just leave all together, but I'll, I'll, uh, what are you I'll managing? dance for a minute here. Um, and he's like, yeah, I wouldn't do that. And I said, why? And he basically said, which is again, like makes perfect sense. Like the moment you do that, then someone else is effectively like driving revenue. They've got a relationship. They're holding that key to that puzzle. Sure. So even if you get into management, like you've got to stay in the arena. And I think that is ultimately like the most sort of applicable, broadly applicable skill set is the ability to sell, whether that's a product, whether that's yourself, whether that's a vision, whether whatever it may to be. To communicate something effectively in a way that may, might move someone better 
exactly. than not communicating it effectively. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you, ta- you and I talked about this recently when we were kind of doing like the, within the venture world, well, yeah, like I mean, I asset call, raising for dummies, right? Yeah, this is why, this is why you have friends, everybody. I'm like, okay, I've got to do something. I, I'm starting to think about the process of raising money and I want to talk to someone who I trust, who I'm not pitching to, that yeah. I'm just speaking to openly so you open up your phone and if you're lucky enough you've got someone like nick Shroby, and he picks up and he gives you the full the full breakdown in plain english about how you should think about raising money and the way that you did it was the, it was the complete opposite of what i thought the conversation was i was like I gotta get my charts out my cap tables and my this and my ti 83 plus yeah. and like you were gonna go through and you were just like no you're in an early stage company in an early stage startup there is no track record yeah. there is no numbers to go through there are no charts and graphs and even if they were they would be make believe and bullshit mm-hmm. so then you say well you have to go a step deeper yeah. you have to go to the track record of you the person exactly. who are you what is your charts and graphs do you crack the second something goes wrong and throw up your hands and you have a string of uh, failed companies that you, you know, you freaked out and, and abandoned ship and let it sink with other co-founders and money wasted? Is that your data chart? Is that your graph? Is yeah. that your fucking, you know, a scatter plot? Or are you the guy that gets up and takes the punch and fucking gets back and shows back up and asks for more every day, yeah. slowly getting smarter and stronger? And you're like, well, there's a way that I do that by talking to someone that perhaps they don't even know that they're being assessed yeah. on that level. No, exactly. And, and that's what you're looking for 100%. in terms of fundraising, which I loved because yeah. I was like, you know, I just love when I can do, I'm like, I could do that. Yeah. But what I will say is even later on in a company's life cycle, when I was like selling hedge funds, if I was going into a room and I just started to say, have you heard about Coca-Cola? This is why we like people like, okay, got it. And have you heard about Microsoft? Well, this is why we like it. And like, this is, you know, latest earnings report. And this is what we see for forward guidance. And this is how we're thinking about new product development. And they just made these changes at the management level and blah, blah, blah. Like there's nothing that's, I'm literally just reading facts that have occurred off of a sheet of paper. Right. Uh, that's great. And I'm not discrediting them as being important from a like due diligence perspective. Great. But in my personal opinion is like, if the point is you are pitching something, the table stakes have to be, is this at least like halfway good, good enough, right? Like if, if you're out there raising a fund and you're like, so we, I don't know, do 10% annualized and slow standard deviation. Okay, great. Well, that should be like, you're in the business of investment management. You should probably have a pretty good idea of how right. to manage investments. End of story. Right. That's like a runner saying, I've got running shoes. Yeah, exactly. Great. So you can get on track. But then beyond that, I think is where like you've got to, this is again, my opinion, but you got to invest a little bit more time in figuring out the way to properly express how your interpretation of things is very unique. And I do agree that in some ways it's hard in the VC world earlier on what I'm, what I am personally looking to analyze is like the person and their capabilities as a business leader. And then the byproduct of that analysis is whether that business they are leading is good, but like that's going to be a very quick check of the box. Do I think that like the macro environment is supportive of this idea? What kind of game plan have they created? Does it match up with whatever my own opinions are on kind of the universe? Okay, good. Now put that aside because I've, I've sort of addressed the table stakes. Now tell me about you. Let's lean into some of the uniqueness. And if someone just sort of like answers the quote, like tell me about yourself. And they're like, well, you know, I did this. And then they just start reading me their resume. That's not going to be interesting. And I think I told you this on the phone. I was like, dude, if you say to me like, hey, I used to be trading like multi hundred million dollar blocks. And then five years later was doing something very different and completely had to reinvent myself. And here's the details of that reinvention. And now I'm sitting in this seat that's going to be infinitely more interesting to me. And I think a fairly good barometer for your ability to get kicked in the balls, come back out of it, not unscathed, but with knowing a thousand ways to not break your leg again. Mm -hmm. And that's very valuable intel. I think I told you this when we last spoke, sometimes founders come up to me and and, uh, I ask them about themselves. I'm like, well, I started this other company. I said, how'd it go? And they're like crashed and burned that actually piques my interest in a positive way in in a lot of cases more than if they had a successful business. And the reason for that is because 
they got punched in the mouth and now they're back at it with the skills of having to learn exactly what it feels like to get punched in the mouth. Well, it's that's where strength and stability comes from because if you were to get so lucky or fortunate to knock one out the first time, you've built no roots. You've got yeah. no sea legs. Yeah. You're fucking walking on stilts, you know, <laughs> and we're just you're just waiting to get kicked over in the carnival and all the kids are going to laugh at you. You yeah. know like you're 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 in a far more precarious place to succeed because you haven't developed any footing. The failures are the footing. The failure is the mortar in the house, right? So when when you see people that are lotto winners, uh, it's a curse. Winning the lottery, especially if you've come from poverty or you, you're, in a, you're in a lower than ideal situation, it will kill you. Winning the lottery is usually a, a ticket to the grave, mm -hmm. whether it's through addiction, whether it's through uh, murder. I mean, if I, I in my book, in my book, that's we did a heavy amount of research. We went through a whole study of, and people have done this before of lotto winners. But the 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 name of the game when you win the lottery is it makes you incredibly weak because it exposes you to an an, an unbelievable amount of scrutiny, theft, um, every every trick and conniving thing you can imagine is now pointed at you yeah. and you can go and you know get addicted to whatever substance you'd like and an unlimited quantity you're you are you are the one of the most at risk people on planet earth now as someone that's built a small business a small um you know uh, a laundromat that ends up you know going in you know being 400 laundromats across you know uh Pennsylvania and yeah. you, you make 4 million dollars a year you know and you've suffered and you've had you know whatever you've, you've had things close and towns go up and go down and this and that it's like you become very very strong mm -hmm. so you give a million bucks to the uh, a couple million bucks to the guy that owns the laundromat that's eaten shit for 100 fucking years and built coin operated businesses in small towns in in Pennsylvania versus the guy that got handed a 50 million dollar check you know who's going to win the boxing match of life yeah that's a, i think that sits at the heart of what you and i are basically talking about is like you go through those motions i think the hope certainly for me is you win or you learn mm -hmm. as you go along and then like which i love i stole that and stuck it in one of my um it's a great quote you're either winning or you're learning like i say that to my sons like you're either winning or you're learning um, it goes back to my point, like you lost. Okay. What'd you learn? A thousand ways not to break your leg. Perfect. Like use that the next time out. Um, and I do think to the credit of like a lot of people our age and younger, they are more, it seems to me more actively saying, okay, I got this win and the experience or the, whatever my takeaway was, I've like put that in my backpack and I'm, I'm carrying it into the next thing or I got rocked and I lost here. This is what I learned. And I'm taking that along with me. And that over time, I think, becomes this set of experiences, which is the result of decisions you made and actions you took, which ultimately become your character, that then paint your very, very unique mosaic for why you are the dude to do this. And Strength. That's exactly what you and I, 15 years ago, sitting on that back porch, Probably didn't know it at the time, but I think... <laughs> no, <laughs> I, think I did not know it at the we time. We were having this conversation, and I think it was the beginning kind of inkling of what it is we're talking about today, which is, like, find whatever that authentic thread is that you think you can pull on, and, like, pull on it as much as is reasonable. Um, like you said, it doesn't mean you have to just, like, go and do something crazy and, like, move to Thailand and be like, oh, I'm going to do that. But find whatever this authentic thread is that you think fully aligns with the character you're trying to cultivate, pull on it, and then see what comes of it, right? But, like, be learning the whole time. Like, you pull it, okay, the thread turned to blue. What did I learn? From? That's mm -hmm. the kind of way I think that ultimately you can get to where you think I'm not just existing, I'm actually living here. I think that's a good place to end. It's kind of what I do. I think that's uh, Nick Schrobenhauser. Thank you for coming on the show, man. It's been my pleasure. Um, this has been too long since I saw you. Very so fun, we were... very easy. Yeah. And uh, I'll see you again soon, my man. Thanks for coming out to Chicago. My pleasure, buddy.